This is Church of Christ. In just a few moments, we'll be reading from James chapter 4. We've got a great crowd. I know there's several visitors with us, everybody visiting with their mothers. And uh, I know there's a few people out and other congregations visiting their mothers. So we're glad to have you with us. Uh, if you are visiting with us, uh, one of our ushers, Barry Cook, will be walking down the center aisle. Uh, if you don't care, just to raise your hand. He's got some information on the church, a visitor's packet. Inside there's a card. Uh, if you don't care, to fill that card out. And uh, gives us a record of your attendance. Uh, we're thankful you come our way. Now for our reading, James chapter 4. It's a really good reading over how we uh, plan for things in the future and how we use our time and, and kind of how we think about time. Come now, you who will say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Number 236. All of our songs this morning will be on the PowerPoint. But for those that prefer the book, 236. Seven hundred thirty. <clears throat> Seven thirty after this song will be letting our opening prayer.
Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we trust our hearts are humble as we bow before thy presence this Lord's day morning. Father, we are so thankful unto thee for every blessing of life that you have so bountifully placed upon us. We're thankful, Father, for all the material things that we take for granted and especially are we thankful for the opportunity and for to meet here and to enjoy the blessings of this hour. Father, we ask thy blessings this morning upon those that have best an interest in our prayers that are sick and have ailments that we may not even know about. We pray, Father, that you would bless them all with the renewal of health according to thy will. We pray, Father, for Brother Hale Wright, that your healing hand would continue upon him and that he would uh, enjoy a better state of health in days to come. Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones or have broken hearts for whatever the reason may be, that you would suit unto them the blessings that they stand in need of this day. Father, we ask thy blessings upon the congregation of thy people here at Carthage. We pray for the work that we're involved with and those things that we support financially. We pray that thy blessings be upon it, that we would work together as Christian people and that glory and honor would be brought to thy name in all that we do and support. We pray, Father, for forgiveness of any wrong in our life. We know that we're weak and sinful creatures. We pray that you would Look into our hearts and forgive us and give us the strength and wisdom that overcome the things wherein we're weak and continue to sin. We're thankful, Father, this morning for a country to live in that where we can have peace and tranquility and have the opportunity to support our families in a proper manner and to meet on occasions such as this without fear of harm. And Father, we're especially thankful this morning for all of our mothers that are present here and for the world over. We pray a special blessing upon them. We pray for those that may not even be mothers but have a caring heart for children. And we pray that you would be with us all. And we know that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ when we render obedience to thy will. We pray, Father, that if there be one here today that has never obeyed the gospel, that they would listen attentively and consider the things that are said, and if possible, maybe render obedience while time yet exists and the opportunity exists. We pray, Father, that you would bless our service. We trust that all things will be decent and in order and as thou hast directed, and continue to bless us as we serve thee. We know... we. Father, we're again, we're thankful for all the blessings that we have through thy son, Jesus. What a friend we have in him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. For those wishing to mark in the songbook, our invitation song this morning will be 179. 179. <clears throat> And before the lesson, 315, 315, let's sing the first and third, and let's stand as we sing this song. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days, and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home,
It is indeed a wonderful occasion when we have the opportunity to assemble together and worship God in spirit and in truth. That is true every Lord's Day of the year. And I know that there are those visiting with us today, and you uh, make it just a, a greater day uh, to see you and to have you here visiting with mom especially and family, and uh, that is really a great honor. Study guides will be brought down the aisle, and you will, if you'll get the attention of the ushers, uh, please uh, take one, take notes on this morning's lesson, write down some scriptures, and uh, study them further as you have time and opportunity to do so. As you see on the screen, our lesson this morning is entitled, Those of Whom the world was not worthy. This statement is found in Hebrews chapter 11. I want us to look at that text in Hebrews 11 verses 37 through 40. You're aware of the fact that Hebrews 11 of course is what we have termed sometimes and others have to faith's hall of fame are the heroes of faith. There's any number of designations that have been given to the characters that are alluded to in Hebrews chapter 11. It's a great faith-building chapter. It will help us to have a good overview of the Scriptures because it takes us back to the beginning of the Old Testament and brings us on through to the time of the prophets, the minor prophets even, of whom uh, we're told in this chapter. But I want us to concentrate especially on this section of Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 37. Here's what the Hebrews writer wrote. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And here the writer puts a little what we call a parenthetical expression in. Of whom the world was not worthy. People who are described as having gone through all of these things are then said to be people of whom the world was not even worthy. Most people would look down on those folks who are being here described. But inspiration tells us the world was not even worthy of these people. That is an intriguing statement. Then he goes on to elaborate further. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Look at where they lived. They didn't live in king's palaces. They didn't live in capital cities. They were not sitting in the halls of Congress. They were not doing anything, didn't live anywhere acquainted with greatness, but they're people of whom the world was not worthy. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. It's tempting to go into all of these things about the word better in the book of Hebrews. We'll save that for a later study perhaps. And so many of the things that are said about the promise and the promises of God in the book of Hebrews. But I want us to focus on that particular statement of whom the world was not worthy. Today is Mother's Day. Elaine laid a little article 
or put an article in uh, the tray in my door the other day. I thought it was nice. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until your father gets home. Remember that one? Mom can teach, only moms can teach these lessons. My mother taught me about receiving. You're going to get it when you get home. My mother taught me about logic. If you fall out of that swing and break your neck, you're not going to the store with me. Now that's logical. My mother taught me to think ahead. If you don't pass your spelling test, you will never get a good job. Taught me about humor as well. When that lawnmower cuts off your toes, don't come running to me. That's a good one. Mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you will never grow up. My mother taught me about genetics. You're just like your father. <laughs> I thought that was a good one. And also, my mother taught me about my roots. Do you think you were born in a barn? And then, this is probably the best one. Only a mom can teach you about justice. One of these days you'll have kids and I hope they turn out just like you. Then you'll see what it's like. Now those are all a little bit comical and humorous, but we do realize that moms occupy a place in life that only they can fill. There was a church program being put on one time by some kids and a little boy was supposed to recite a passage of scripture. And when he got up in front of this huge crowd of people and he looked out and he saw all those eyes peering at him, you know, and he realized he was the center of attention. He, though he had practiced and practiced and practiced, those words just left him. And his mother, sitting over here to this side, was so frantic, she was even more nervous and scared than the child was. And uh, she kept looking at him. Finally, he looked at her, and she began uh, speaking to him, you know, whispering, well, not even whispering, just lipping it to him. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And all of a sudden his face lit up and he said, My mother is the light of the world. He got it right, didn't he? Mothers are to be the light of the world too. How does this figure into our text? Well, mothers are prominent in the book of Hebrews as well. Hebrews chapter 11 mentions women who received their children back to life. That is in verse 35. And that no doubt is a reference to two instances in the books of the Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we read of Elijah bringing back to life the son of of the woman of Zarephath. That would be one instance. And then Elisha later on would give the Shunammite woman her child back alive. There were two prophets who performed a miraculous work, the work of God to give mothers their children again. And that's no doubt part of the reference that is uh, being alluded to in verse 35 of Hebrews 11. So we realize that along with Sarah and other women that are mentioned, Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, though not named, I don't think by name, in Hebrews 11, are alluded to. 
These were great women of faith as well. Albert Barnes comments on the statement at which we're looking, those of whom the world was not worthy. And he says, this is a most beautiful expression. It is at once a statement of their eminent holiness and of the wickedness of the rest of mankind. End of quote. That is indeed an accurate and remarkable statement. The idea is that the world was so wicked, it had no claim that such holy persons should live in it. Think about how wicked and corrupt the world was in the days of Noah. So much so that God said, I'm going to destroy the earth and all living things therein. Man had become so evil and corrupt that every imagination of his heart was said to be evil continually. There was no break in it. There was no turning it around. There was absolutely no penitence. And so God fulfilled His promise and sent the flood. You'll notice that in the text they were destitute, afflicted, and tormented wanderers. Wandering about from place to place to escape persecution, to find a place of solace and comfort and peace. And it was hard to do. They had such character that so far exceeded that of the world that it is said the world did not deserve them. Most people would have viewed some of those great men and women as outcasts. And yet God's description of them is the world is not even worthy of them. They are so much people of faith they placed their faith in God and He blessed them and cared for them and immortalized them by recording these things that we now read in Hebrews chapter 11 as well as throughout the Scriptures. But let's look at some things that we can learn from this text. Notice that he said, the world, the world does not deserve them. There are some things that we need to take note of about the world. We need to beware of the world. The Bible tells us, for example, th at least three things about it. The world treats people differently than it should. Because the world does not seem to grasp the significance of righteousness. They fail to appreciate goodness even when it is among them. They, instead of admiring righteousness, they look down upon it. There are people who make fun of those who seek to live righteous, upright lives. Look at how Jesus was treated. He did no sin, neither was guile in his mouth. But he met the death of a common criminal. There he was in the midst of a wicked and contemptible people. But they did not admire his, quote, beauty, nor the life that he lived among them. John 1, 12 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He said of Jerusalem, How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens beneath her wings, but you would not. When you read Hebrews 11, you see the people of God being treated so terribly. You have them being cast into lion's dens, into fiery furnaces, into pits 
and places of great danger, all because and only because they were different. They were different in a good way. They were good people of faith and righteousness and truth. The world treats people differently than it should. Since Jesus was treated that way, we should not really expect anything differently if we live and walk in His footsteps. There will be those who will hold us in contempt as well. Secondly, the world values things that are far short of God's glory. God's values and the values of people are far different. You remember that great text in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. That's what God said. That's how he appraised the situation. He said, people do not appreciate my ways. And some of the saddest words you will find are scattered all through the books of prophecy. As God's word is held in contempt, cast aside as if it were mere trash or rubbish, and people show little respect for it. And some of the same things are going on today. When the values that are set forth in the scriptures, are derided and scorned and ridiculed. But God's word is still the truth. The world has a way of not valuing God and His word. And the world's values are far short of the values of God. How many people are there who really appreciate how Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount? The Beatitudes. How long has it been since you really studied those, looked at them? How often do we think about them? Wonderful, wonderful statements of truth. The world has precious little time for them. The world also compels us to conform. Remember Romans 12, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Heard someone at the lectureship at Carnes just the other day talking about the jello mold and how you could shape gelatin, you know, with those molds. And of course, my mind always go back, goes back a little bit further to the butter molds. One of my aunts had a butter mold. And when I went to her house and ate, I thought she had the most beautiful butter I'd ever seen. Because if I remember correctly, it had a flower or something in the top of it and, and was just so precise. She would mold the butter and take it to, to uh, the, one of the stores in Gainesboro. Mr. Coleman's, I believe, and sell the butter to him, and he would sell it then to his uh, customers as they came in. But that butter looked exactly like the inside of that mold. Now the world tries to, that's really what this word means. The word conformed is from a Greek term that literally means and designates poured into the mold of. So the world is going to mold us. It wants us to conform. The world does become a little bit nervous and sensitive when confronted with righteousness and truth. So how do they ease their, their pangs of conscience? They want to make the, everybody like they are. That way, they'll not be too uncomfortable. Go back to your school days. You know, here's a person that 
just really studies hard and prepares for the test that's coming up. Some of the other students are not prepared for it. They haven't burnt the midnight oil and, and studied like they should. So they go to that really smart student and say, now don't you do really well on this test? Teacher said in college he's going to grade on a curve. And there was always one or two students who would ruin the curve. And some of the others tried to get them to dumb it down a little so they could fare better. That's the way the world operates. Secondly, why were the faithful complimented? Why are these people said to be those of whom the world was not worthy? What characteristics did they have? What caused them to stand out so that this statement would be made about them? In the first place, they believed against all odds. What was the possibility of Abraham and Sarah having a child? Most people would say little to none. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, verse 6 says. We're told in verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is critically important. We cannot be a Christian, we cannot be pleasing to God without it. You study all of those examples. And they defied logic oftentimes because they said, God said that this is going to happen. We believe it. And as in Noah's example, we're going to prepare. And so they did. Noah built that ark. There are many great Bible scholars who are of the opinion that it had never rained until the time of the flood. They go back to that mention of a continual mist coming up from the ground. Maybe like a heavy dew. If you've walked through your yard early some morning after it has been, you know, a flu- there's been a fluctuation in temperature, you know that the dew starts We used to say the dew falls. Dew starts developing very early on. And by the next morning, you know, there's quite a bit of moisture in the the grass and on the ground. Really something to behold. So Noah probably had never seen a storm cloud. I don't know if it had thundered and lightened any or not. But you can imagine a fellow building... I don't know if he's building in his backyard or not. He's taken a large backyard, building a, a boat of those dimensions when it had never rained. And Abraham being told, just leave home, son, and start walking and wondering, and I'll guide you to a place that afterward you'll receive. But Abraham never really had a deed to any part of the promised land. He inherited it through his descendants and his descendants inherited it through his faith. But they believed against all odds. They valued faithfulness over fame. Moses is a good example. It is well within the limits and very reasonable to say that Moses probably would have been a Pharaoh. Now can you imagine all of the things that that would have included? All of the fineries of Egypt and palace life, all the comforts, all the pleasures. Hebrews 11 says, that he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I mean, pleasure pleases us. We like pleasurable things. 
But Moses had the spiritual foresight because of his faith to have consideration for that recompense of reward that awaited the faithful. He knew who he was, so he chose to suffer with his people. People who believed in the same God. He wanted to be with them. Oh, it cost him. He had to go and live 40 years out in the wilderness. He was one of those that wandered around and probably slept in some caves and other places. Probably didn't have the fine apparel that he had had as a prince growing up in Egypt. Out there taking care of sheep and goats. But God was pleased with him. They valued faithfulness over fame. Do we? Will we? We certainly should. They resisted the pressure to conform. You do this or else. Look at Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We want you to be like us. Daniel refused. So did the other three. They resisted the pressure to conform. Sometimes people say, oh, it, it's really, really hard to be different. It is. But if you'll live faithfully and go to heaven, you might be able to talk to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to Daniel and say, how was it back then? What was he like in that lion's den? And might they say something like, well, you see that God on his throne? He took care of us. And he will still do it today. Let's resist the pressure to conform. Those of whom the world was not worthy did these three things. And then, what can we take from these examples and this statement? Those of whom the world was not worthy. We learn first of all that God really loves and respects the faithful. He watched over them. He cared for them. He fed them through providential and miraculous means. He did everything that they needed. Even to the point of chastising them and exerting discipline upon them in a corrective way. But God really loves and respects the faithful. How much? Enough to give them a crown of life that fades not away. Revelation 2.10 Be thou faithful unto death and I will give unto thee a crown of life. You know, the cross bearers will be the ones who wear the crowns. Sometimes we forget that. We are called upon to take up our cross and follow the Lord, to do it faithfully, to do it daily. But we're assured that there will be a crown awaiting the faithful. We learn from these examples that God's work and His Word are always right and His way is real. It's not just a figment of someone's vivid imagination. It's not simply a fairy tale, a myth, or a legend. God has proven over and over again, my ways are above your ways. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. So let the heavenly Father direct them. Let him lead you. Let him be your shepherd. His word is the truth. And by that truth, we are made free. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is indeed a most conclusive statement. Then thirdly, the world is wrong in its assessment of things divine. You can realize that if you'll read Galatians 5. I begin reading in about verse 19 where you read about all the works of the flesh. And then in about verses 22 and 23, you read of the fruit of the Spirit. Adultery, fornication, third, uh, murders, thefts, all of those things are classified as the works of the flesh. Envies, heresies, all of these wicked attitudes, things that are taught doctrinally that are out of harmony with God's will, all of those things are attributed to the flesh. But he said love and joy and peace and all those things, that's the fruit of the Spirit. The world goes with the works of the flesh. That's what's important to them. The fruit of the Spirit is what is important to those of whom the world is not worthy. Those of whom the world is not worthy. Have you ever known someone like this? Have you known more than one person like this? I've been blessed in the years that I've preached to know many people to whom this statement rings true. Those of whom the world is not worthy. We think of a, a little child, innocent, uh, spotless, so trusting, caring, and kind, that has abusive parents. How could that be? There is an instance of one of whom even those parents were not worthy. Parents who do not appreciate their children. Husbands who have a good wife. Wives who have good husbands. And they fail to love and respect them as they should. You know, this statement rings true in reference to so many situations. Let us so live that we can be worthy as it were. Though we're still unprofitable servants when we've done our best. God will estimate us and view us if we will walk in the steps of His Son as being worthy children of His. The world may not respect you, may not appreciate you, but it can be done because Hebrews 11 proves it can. If you're not a child of God, why not do those things that the New Testament instructs you to do to become such. You've heard the gospel. Believe it with all your heart. Repent of every sin. Confess the sweet name of Jesus before men and so that you can be baptized into Christ and be cleansed by His precious blood. And you can be added to the Lord's family where you can serve Him faithfully. Get out of the world. Get into Christ. Walk faithfully with Him and you will enter heaven one day. If you're an erring child of God and you have sinned against the Lord, His church, His people, you brought reproach upon His name, confess that sin. And be restored to your first love. We invite you to come if you're subject as we stand and sing. God is calling the prodigal, come without delay.
Our